I'm Jim Coleman, and um, there was a time when I, uh, when I taught the uh, death penalty clinic uh, here at the law school, uh, but we discontinued uh, the clinic uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, when, when, when the clinic operated, we worked very closely with the uh, Center for Death Penalty Litigation, uh, and uh, we are uh, pleased to have with us uh, today to talk about the death penalty uh, in light of the upcoming uh, Supreme Court term, as well as uh, some of the significant cases that the Supreme Court uh, decided last year, uh, and also because uh, North Carolina is a state where uh, there uh, is a lot of activity uh, going on relating to the death penalty. Uh, and the center uh, is in the middle of all of it. Um, uh, Tom Maher is the executive director of the Center for Death Penalty Litigation, uh, which is located uh, here in Durham. Uh, the center represents clients on death row, trains lawyers involved in post-conviction litigation, and provides assistance uh, to lawyers involved in uh, capital trials. Uh, in fact, the center is involved in, in all aspects of the uh, death penalty uh, in North Carolina, uh, including uh, working on and advising lawyers involved uh, with clemency campaigns. Uh, and the center has been uh, one of the principal uh, actors in the effort to, uh, to obtain a moratorium on executions uh, in this state. As I said, until we discontinued the death penalty clinic, uh, we worked closely with the center uh, to obtain cases uh, in post-conviction that students uh, worked on uh, as part of their uh, clinic experience. Uh, before joining the center, Tom was in private practice representing clients in civil and criminal matters uh, in both, at both the trial level and on appeal. Uh, he was one of the, I don't know if you want me to tell him about this, but you, he was one of the defense lawyers who, who represented Michael Peterson, uh, a, 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 a controversial uh, murder case uh, here in Durham a, a few years ago that's now the subject of a documentary uh, done by a French uh, film company. Uh, Tom earned his law degree from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. That's unfortunate, but uh, <laughs> uh, basketball not not if, well, <laughs> uh, and he spent two years clerking uh, for the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals uh, before he uh, entered into private practice. He has taught trial practice uh, to law students and attorneys, uh, including in the trial advocacy program uh, here at Duke, uh, which was the redemption, I guess, for going to uh, Carolina. Uh, as I say, he's going to discuss some of the significant current issues involving the death penalty. Uh, and uh, following his remarks, uh, there'll be an opportunity uh, for you to ask questions uh, and for uh, Tom to uh, respond to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the event that something comes up that uh, where I think I can make a contribution, I also will, uh, will respond. So, Tom, welcome to Duke. Thanks. Uh, I, I should, I guess, by way of full disclosure, say that the reason I went to UNC instead of Duke was that Duke didn't let me in. So uh, at the time I applied, I wasn't aware of how expensive it was, but uh, I had applied. Uh, and when I went to UNC, I graduated the year that Michael Jordan hit the shot to win the national championship. So in retrospect, I was very happy with going to UNC. Uh, and I, I should comment on the Peterson case. So one of the things I learned from the Peterson case is that you can develop a reputation by losing a big case repeatedly on television. Uh, we lost at trial, I lost in the Court of Appeals, and I lost in the North Carolina Supreme Court, and they were all televised. Uh, in fact, my wife, when she found out that I was appearing at the Court of Appeals on television for the first time in, I think, North Carolina history, said that I needed to buy a new suit. Uh, I now work at CDPL, and I'm going to talk some about U.S. Supreme Court cases because I know that that is the function of this group, uh, but I'm also going to talk about the death penalty in North Carolina and some issues that you know, the U.S. Supreme Court has spoken to, but some that probably hasn't. 
because this is, uh, I guess I tend to think of it as the best of times and worst of times for the death penalty in North Carolina. I guess you could say that whichever side of the divide you're on, but uh, CDPL, as we explained to people who don't know us, is against the death penalty uh, and uh, represent clients at the trial level. Uh, I represent clients facing capital trials. I represent clients on direct appeal to the North Carolina Supreme Court who've been sentenced to death. And the principal thing we do is represent clients who have lost at trial, lost uh, at appeal, and are now going through the post-conviction process, either in state court or federal court, uh, trying to overturn their convictions or death sentences. Uh, we are a nonprofit law firm. We have roughly a dozen attorneys who spend most of their time representing uh, death row clients. We have a couple attorneys who spend most of their time consulting with lawyers throughout the state uh, on trial strategy or meeting with clients trying to persuade them to take pleas and things of that nature. Uh, and so we have been, we're in a unique position. Uh, we obviously know something about just about every case that's a capital or potential capital case or uh, sentence to death case in North Carolina. Uh, we have contact with every lawyer who's doing these cases. We have contact with the mitigation investigators, the fact investigators, mental health experts, things of that nature. Uh, we consult with people at every stage, and to a certain extent, we try to get involved in any kind of legislation that will affect uh, the death penalty in North Carolina or in other states. Uh, when I first began doing death penalty representation back after I went to Chicago for uh, two years back when the Cubs were not winning, uh, and then I returned here, I began doing appointed appellate work. Uh, and that would be in the mid-1980s, and there were basically no standards for who could be appointed to do a direct capital appeal, which resulted in me being appointed to do a direct capital appeal by myself. Uh, and I'd never done uh, a direct appeal. I'd clerked for a federal judge, but it turns out that's not really good training for doing appeals. Uh, since then, uh, North Carolina has come a long way in the quality of representation for death-sentenced uh, inmates. And there have been a number of other issues that have developed. As a result, uh, in North Carolina in the earlier mid-90s, uh, we would get 25, 30, 35 death sentences a year. I mean, it'd be two or three every month. Uh, this year, in 2008, there's been a grand total of zero death sentences returned by juries, despite a number of capital trials. Last year, there were three. Uh, since 2001, there's been four or five a year, and, it, and it's dropping. Uh, and so in terms of, of the death penalty at the trial level, there's been this huge sea change, some of which is due to U.S. Supreme Court decisions, some of which is due to the public's changing attitude towards the death penalty. Uh, as a result of numerous exonerations and cases, including some, for example, like the Duke LaCrosse case, where uh, the public is starting to realize that the criminal justice system is far from perfect, jurors are less willing to impose the ultimate sanction. Uh, in my trial work in picking jurors, I have, I think in the last couple of capital juries I've picked, every single one, some juror says, you know, I'm really concerned that we're going to sentence to death somebody who's not guilty. Unfortunately, in my cases, my clients have confessed, there's no doubt that they're guilty and that particular attitude isn't a big help. But it does, I think, uh, affect jurors' willingness to impose the death penalty. The other change is that we now have life without the possibility of parole as an alternative to the death penalty. And that, probably out of all the changes, is the biggest reason jurors are not imposing the death penalty. Routinely, jurors in the past would ask judges, what does a life sentence mean? And a judge would tell them, well, you are to act as if it means life in making your decision. Well, the jurors weren't idiots. And when you tell somebody you are to act as if it means something, you are telling them that it doesn't mean that. Uh, and it means something you're not going to actually explain to them. And so they would think that it meant, you know, probation or parole or whatever, uh, and routinely sentence somebody to death because they were concerned with them getting out and not as concerned that they, in fact, receive the death sentence. We also now have uh, Indigent Defense Services, which is a state agency that oversees uh, defense services and is very active in making sure that capital defendants get qualified counsel, get qualified resources. Uh, so now people have two lawyers at every stage, you have access to mental health experts, you have access to mitigation investigators, and uh, the quality of representation, while not perfect, has gone up dramatically. Uh, 
One of the results, uh, and I think you see it uh, reflected in the opinions of some Supreme Court justices, is that convictions which, when they were entered at the time, seemed to be kind of open and shut, or at least not questionable, uh, later investigation showed that there were serious flaws in the case. Uh, North Carolina has had a number of reasonably high-profile exonerations in the last couple of years. There was a Glenn Chapman, for example, was convicted of two separate and seemingly unrelated murders and sentenced to death in both of them. And then it turned out that the state had managed to withhold Brady evidence in both cases. Uh, which suggested strongly that in one case the victim hadn't been murdered at all, uh, had simply died from a drug overdose, and in the second case, you know, reasonably excluded him as being the person who could have committed the murder. He was granted a new trial in both cases, and the district attorney, having looked at it, said, well, I'm not going to try him at all, and he's now a free person. Uh, Hoffman, Jonathan Hoffman, was convicted. Uh, of a murder, and it turned out that the district attorney not only withheld information at the trial level about deals he'd made, but then when he turned over documents in post-conviction, had uh, reformatted them, shall we say, so that information was missing from the documents. Eventually it came to light. He was awarded a new trial, and the district attorney dropped charges in his case. Uh, Levon Jones, who I represented on direct appeal many years ago, got as far as federal district court when it became clear that he had received uh, terrible representation throughout the case uh, and was given a new trial and the charges were dropped in his case. So what we've seen routinely is cases which, when they were tried at the time and, and you looked at them, seemed unremarkable, turned out to have very serious flaws. And at least for some uh, judges and justices, the sense that this system is not working perfectly, I think, is, is uh, percolating. Uh, and, in fact, shows up in some concerns, for example, in the Kennedy opinion about whether we should be having the death penalty for somebody who commits a non-homicide child rape, and the difficulty in those cases, uh, even more than in murder cases, of sometimes knowing whether the person is truly guilty. So we now have, at the trial level, far fewer uh, death sentences. We're having you know, some relief being granted in post-conviction cases. One of the cases that Professor Coleman knows well uh, and actually is related to the Panetti decision in some respects, is uh, Guy Legrand in North Carolina. Guy was charged with having been hired to kill uh, a man's wife. The person who hired him was given a plea deal and testified. Uh, Guy decided that he would represent himself at trial, uh, and either as a matter of making a statement or just a lack of wardrobe, uh, went through the trial wearing a Superman T-shirt, uh, and at least the guilt-innocence phase, if you read his cross-examinations, were somewhat rational. But by the time the jury convicted him and he was uh, representing himself at sentencing, he was suggesting that they, jurors would all dance at the feet of his father in hell and that they could kiss his black ass in the Heiligmeier's furniture showroom, I believe. Uh, oddly enough, the jurors sentenced him to death. Uh, and uh, his mental state didn't improve with time. He decided to forego post-conviction proceedings in state court and went straight to federal court, which it turns out you really can't do, uh, and ultimately was running out of options in the real world, not in his world. Uh, in his world, he was expecting the governor to give him either millions or hundreds of millions or billions of dollars and not only give him clemency but to exonerate him, and he would write letters to his family about how they were going to share this money and also wrote letters about anvils falling from the sky. Uh, and ultimately, was lucky enough to have Professor Coleman and Jay Ferguson and some other folks work on his case. And although he refused to meet with his lawyers or to recognize they were his lawyers, ultimately a judge found that he was uh, not competent to be executed. Uh, and you know, this was a case that the state fought hard throughout the proceedings. Hopefully, they will do the right thing now. Um, so we've got. What's left, though, is a huge number of people on death row. We have over 160 people on North Carolina's death row. Uh, and I would tell you that there are a significant number of them who have gone all the way through the court process and are facing execution but for what we are referring to as the moratorium. Uh, it is a de facto moratorium uh, that has resulted from a number of factors and could dissolve you know, at any unspecified time period, at which point uh, North Carolina will face an unprecedented number of actual executions. 
Uh, the most executions in recent memory in any given year was seven, uh, which for North Carolina was a huge number. We're not quite at Texas levels yet. Uh, if the moratorium ended next year, we'd be talking multiples of that in terms of the number of executions. They could be executing you know, somebody once a week for months and months. Uh, so uh, in terms of trials, jurors are increasingly reluctant to impose a death sentence. The district attorneys are increasingly willing to either not seek death or to offer pleas. Uh, but in the post-conviction world, we've got all these cases, many of which are very old, uh, that are lining up for execution. And I don't know how much any of you have ever studied federal habeas, uh, but it's uh, increasingly difficult to get relief by the time you get to federal court. There's one gentleman that I can think of in recent history who actually got the Fourth Circuit to grant him relief, and he happened to be a rich white dentist. Uh, go figure, of all the people to get relief. Uh, so uh, we, are, we are facing kind of an interesting uh, time, so to speak. And in light of that, one of the reasons we're not having executions, uh, maybe the primary reason, was the whole litigation that ultimately went to the Supreme Court over how executions take place. Uh, and I don't know how many of you have actually followed it or read the decision in Bayes, but the United States Supreme Court ultimately granted cert last year in a case out of Kentucky to deal with the issue of what standards, if any, are we going to have about how executions actually take place. Uh, and the thing about Bayes, you know, and, and we've litigated these cases in North Carolina and I've been involved in these, is it is, I will say, at a gut level, an incredibly strange debate to be having about not whether your client should be executed or whether the trial took place correctly, but how are we going to actually kill the person? And, you know, in theory, as the person's lawyer, you're advocating for a method of execution. Uh, not that they not be executed, but that they be executed in a humane fashion. Uh, the issue arises because of the kind of peculiar way that executions take place in most of the United States. And it's called a three-drug cocktail. Uh, and in essence, the first drug is a barbiturate that is supposed to put the inmate into deep anesthesia. The second drug is a paralytic agent, which is designed to keep uh, the inmate from moving. And then the third drug is a drug that stops the inmate's heart. And if it's done correctly, uh, it is supposed to be painless. And the reason it's supposed to be painless is the deep anesthesia would render the inmate incapable of, of feeling the effects of the next two drugs. The problem arises that the second drug, the paralytic agent, which serves roughly no purpose in actually executing the person, if you were not totally uh, under from the first drug, you will feel that you can't breathe and you will suffocate and you'll be unable to move or express the fact that you are now suffocating because you are paralyzed. Uh, and the third drug uh, is apparently an incredibly excruciatingly painful way to die if you are not in deep anesthesia. It's an incredibly burning sensation as a drug uh, before it stops your heart. And so the issue that it came up and has been litigated for years and years until it finally got to the U.S. Supreme Court was whether that cocktail raised a significant enough risk that the execution would not be painless that it violated the Eighth Amendment. Uh, and one of the oddities, I think, of the law from a defense attorney's perspective is you have to assume, you have to in essence argue, that there is a humane way to execute your client because if there isn't, then the Eighth Amendment has to accept whatever the states come up with. In other words, you can't complain about the three-drug cocktail if you don't have a better alternative uh, because the Eighth Amendment is going to allow executions uh, and your job is to say, well, the system as it is is an un unacceptable risk and therefore we propose uh, a better system. Uh, and to be honest, when you're trying to keep your client from being executed at all, there's something unseemly about talking about how they should do it. Uh, the case went to the Supreme Court, and the result was the U.S. Supreme Court started granting stays pretty much in, I think, almost every case uh, once they granted cert. And so executions nationwide ground to a halt as everybody waited to see what the Supreme Court uh, would do in the Bayes case. Uh, and then in April of this year, they decided that Kentucky's protocol, which was the same three-drug protocol, was constitutional, 
and that the risk, and this was the real, in some ways, issue of it being misadministered was not substantial enough to make it unconstitutional. All of the experts agreed that the cocktail as designed, if it was done properly, would be humane. The question was, was it going to be done properly? Uh, and uh, maybe it's not surprising. Uh, most of the death chambers around the country don't necessarily hire you know, board certified doctors to do the executions. And so you get people, there was a doctor in Missouri, I think it was, who was dyslexic uh, and admitted that he didn't always know the doses he was mixing for the various drugs. Uh, there are people who are not trained properly in you know, uh, doing the injections, things of that nature. The Supreme Court, and it's one of these opinions that I'm sure keep law professors in business because everybody had to write a separate opinion, uh, came down in a way that basically said, the test, two of the justices basically said, well, unless you're intentionally inflicting pain, we don't really worry about this. The fact that you know, it may be poorly designed or poorly done, if you're not intending to inflict pain, that should be the end of it for the Eighth Amendment. The rest of the court said, no, you know, we, we, we are concerned if pain is being inflicted even without that being the intent, if it's being done in a way where there's a substantial and objective risk uh, that the pain, uh, and said that this protocol, if done incorrectly, if there was a substantial enough risk that this protocol would be done incorrectly, that that would be an unconstitutional risk, that the suffocation and the burning would be the type of pain that uh, the Eighth Amendment would be worried about. But in essence said, you know, given Kentucky's training, given the quality of the personnel they use, there isn't a substantial enough risk of botched executions for us to uh, declare this unconstitutional. North Carolina had stays in effect even before Bayes was decided. And the reason was, and this is one of the things I guess you find out when you actually get out of law school and go practice, is that you can never anticipate what's going to happen. There was a state court action filed in front of a judge in Wake County by some inmates who'd gone through the system, were facing execution, and they were challenging uh, in state court North Carolina's three-judge, three-drug protocol. And the, everybody got there for hearing, the judge said, well, you know, I've looked at the statute. And our statute requires that our Council of State approve the protocol. And does, can anybody tell me whether they've ever, ever done that? Well, the Council of State had no idea they were supposed to do that. The Council of State is, you know, uh, Secretary of Labor or something, and group like that, and they basically approve the sale of state land or things of that nature. They had no idea they were supposed to be doing this. Nobody had actually read the statute, apparently. Uh, and they hadn't approved the protocol. And so the judge stayed the executions. Uh, they went back and had some hearings about approving the protocol. There was a lawsuit filed by lawyers in my office about that because they hadn't followed the Administrative Procedures Act. So it turns out I should have paid more attention in Administrative Procedures Law. Uh, and everything has ground to a halt, in part because of whether the Council of State acted properly uh, in approving protocols. So all the wonderful kind of constitutional analysis in Bayes is not really why North Carolina doesn't have executions. It has a lot more to do with a judge actually reading a statute and discovering that the state wasn't doing it correctly. In the meantime, uh, the medical board passed a rule saying it was unethical for licensed doctors in North Carolina to participate in an execution. Uh, and from an Eighth Amendment perspective, it probably doesn't matter whether they're right or wrong about that because if doctors are not allowed to participate, and this is a point that was discussed by the Supreme Court in Bayes, then the state has to find a way to do it without doctors, but you can't stop the executions. In essence, they do what's, you know, as long as it's not presenting an, uh, an unreasonable risk of pain, the fact that the state law pro prohibits doctors, then you do it without doctors. Uh, the medical board got sued uh, over that by the state. It's going up uh, to uh, on appeal to the North Carolina Supreme Court, which probably will hear our arguments this fall. They will decide, you know, did the medical board exceed its jurisdiction in holding that physicians can't participate in executions? Once that's been decided, the council of state can revisit the issue of their protocol, which would either require or not require physician participation. Uh, so those issues are kind of being litigated, they are, in a sense, the fallout of Bayes. I guess if Bayes had said, 
You know, the only issue is whether the state is intentionally inflicting unnecessary pain. It might well have sped up the process in North Carolina. But state law issues have caused the moratorium uh, to continue. At some point, we'll be back in court, presumably once there is a protocol, litigating whether or not that protocol meets the Bayes standard. I will say that I don't think the Bayes standard is terribly high. If you look at the dissent, I think it was Ginsburg's dissent, said, well, gee, I'm dissenting because they're not really monitoring the deep anesthesia of the inmate. Maybe they should flick their eyelids, which didn't strike me as a terribly difficult or meaningful additional step on that. Uh, and clearly, states have geared up and are, are executing inmates. Uh, and I don't think there's been a huge amount of success in challenges to protocols once Bayes was decided. I believe there's a federal judge in Ohio may have ruled that they're supposed to only use the barbiturate. Uh, but for the most part, executions are taking place. Uh, and the effect of Bayes in that respect may be kind of short-lived. Uh, another case that I, I'd like to say is over and done with, but probably may well not be, uh, but is an important case, is Kennedy versus Louisiana. Kennedy is a child rape case. Uh, and what happened is, you know, the United States Supreme Court has, upon a number of occasions, reviewed kind of bright line tests of what either defendants or crimes are <laughs> eligible or not eligible for the death penalty. So over the years, you know, they've ruled that uh, the states cannot constitutionally execute somebody who's mentally retarded. There's still, you know, some debate about what the test for mental retardation is, but it's accepted that under the Eighth Amendment, somebody who is mentally retarded cannot be executed regardless of the crime. Uh, they ruled that if you are under 18, you, can't, you are not eligible for the death penalty uh, under the Eighth Amendment, uh, which has caused some discussion in this area when uh, Eve Carson was murdered in Chapel Hill and arrests were made. One of the defendants is overage and one is underage. And so the underage defendant, I think he was 17, is just not eligible for the death penalty, even though he's also charged with a second murder uh, here in Durham. Uh, there are uh, decisions that outline the extent to which somebody who is guilty under the felony murder rule can it be subject to the death penalty. If you don't actually kill somebody, there's you know, an Eighth Amendment test of your level of involvement that has to be met before you can be subject to the death penalty. One of the cases that was decided a long time ago is a Coker decision where the Supreme Court held that you could not be subject to the death penalty for the rape of an adult woman. Uh, and as I kind of read the history of it, a number of states assumed that, that meant, although the opinion doesn't say this, and in fact, I think says that it's not saying it, that that meant you couldn't be executed for non-homicide offenses, including child rape. Uh, but not everybody agreed with that. And recently, a number of states tried either enacting laws or enforcing laws that made various levels of child rape a capital offense. Some of them, I think, had recidivism requirements uh, some may not have. Louisiana was one of those states. Uh, and Kennedy was uh, charged and convicted for the rape of his stepdaughter and sentenced to death. Uh, there was actually, after that, a second person in Louisiana who was put on death row for child rape. And the case came up to the United States Supreme Court on the issue of whether the Eighth Amendment allowed the death penalty for a non-homicide offense. Uh, and the decision which came down in June uh, was, I believe, five to four, that you cannot be executed for, at least at this level, a non-homicide offense. They're leaving out some other you know, mass crimes. But that, in essence, uh, under the Eighth Amendment, even a child, a brutal child rape, even by somebody with you know, a record of this in an aggravated fashion, it is always disproportionate uh, to execute somebody for that crime. And you know, the, I won't go through all the analysis, but the analysis involves both looking at kind of national consensus to the extent there is a consensus, how many states allow it, how many people are actually subject to it, how often have the states that allowed it actually enforced it. And then, uh, importantly, the court's own kind of moral analysis of whether that crime merits the death penalty. Uh, and the interesting thing in looking through it is that uh, in the opinion holding that it uh, is not subject to the death penalty, the court examines considerations such as the risk of a wrongful conviction. I mean, part of the problem when sex offenses uh, in these cases is there's often not 
conclusive physical evidence. There's sometimes reason to suspect that the child has been coached or has other reasons to misidentify the person who's done it or to claim somebody's done it when they haven't. And so, you know, there's a risk of wrongful conviction. And they've also talked about, you know, from the victim's perspective, the damage of being dragged through a capital trial in which you may well be testifying against a family member uh, and kind of the societal costs for that. And the analysis, in essence, is that, you know, looking, I guess you'd call it a cost-benefit analysis, saying these are some reasons why it would not make sense to impose the death penalty. The dissent's argument, in essence, at least as to some of that, is, well, that's really not the defendant's concern whether the victim would suffer from testifying and therefore not a legitimate reason to prohibit the death penalty. Uh, but certainly uh, the majority opinion makes clear that the scope of what they're willing to consider in deciding whether the Eighth Amendment prohibits the death penalty is fairly broad. Now I say that hopefully it's over. What happened, oddly enough, is after the opinion came out and part of the analysis was how many states have the death penalty for child rape and how many don't, and is there a federal law authorizing the death penalty for rape. Somebody read this and said, whoa, didn't they realize that the military code provides the death penalty for this? Uh, and it turned out nobody briefing the cases had bothered or figured that out. Uh, and so the opinion, and, and the court on its own didn't figure it out, and so the opinion makes a mistake as to the fact as to whether there's any federal basis for the death penalty in this situation. So the state, I believe, has filed a petition for rehearing I think the Solicitor General may have filed as well supporting that. And they haven't ruled on it yet. And I guess, you know, given the importance of the case and how closely divided the vote was, uh, there's at least some risk or some chance that they would decide to revisit the issue in light of, of that uh, statute. Uh, so uh, they rehearings, at least from my experience, have been incredibly rare. But this may be one of those where there's some chance of that happening. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, Panetti had to do with somebody much like Guy Legrand uh, who raised an issue of whether he was competent to be executed by the time he'd gone through all of his various proceedings. Uh, and I've always, uh, Professor Coleman will probably disagree with me because he represents Guy Legrand, I've always thought it an incredibly odd rule that it's okay to kill somebody but only if they understand why you're killing them that somehow somebody who was properly convicted and properly sentenced to death, that we suddenly become humane about it if they don't really understand why they're being sentenced to death. It just strikes me as kind of an odd thing that that, that kind of humanitarianism might just pro prohibit the death penalty to begin with, but apparently it's only for people who become crazy. Uh, and I believe in Panetti's case, uh, and this is I think where these cases come up most often, is where the inmate has delusions. And the delusional disorders, of course, can pr progress. And they don't, they're not you know, psychotic in the sense necessarily of hearing voices or seeing things that aren't there. But they have these fixed delusional belief systems uh, in which they take the reality around them and, and have that fit into their delusions. And in Panetti's case, I believe, I mean, he understood he'd been convicted and that he was facing the death penalty. But if I remember correctly, his delusion was that they were really wanting to execute him because of how he was preaching his religious beliefs, uh, and that that was what this was really all about. Uh, in Guy Legrand's case, I mean, he understood that he had been convicted and sentenced to death for a murder. Uh, he just had this delusional belief that he was not, in fact, going to be executed, that the governor would not only grant him clemency, but would pay him a huge amount of money uh, and Professor Coleman unwisely did not get a contingency fee in his case uh, and was in fact going to be released uh, and pardoned. And so it's these kind of delusions that are very difficult to dispel because the mental illness allows the inmate to incorporate basically any aspect of reality and fit it into their delusional system. And Panetti had these delusions. The case uh, is important you know, in a sense for reaffirming that we will not execute people who don't understand why they're being executed. It's also important procedurally because it dealt with the issue of when this issue can be raised. Uh, one of the incredibly frustrating things about litigating post-conviction cases for capital clients, for any client, but particularly capital clients, is all the procedural hurdles you have to overcome. We spend more than half our time fighting over whether the issue raised in post-conviction should have been raised on direct appeal.
whether an issue being raised in federal court was properly exhausted and fairly presented in state court, uh, whether something should have been raised in a first habeas as opposed to a second. And what the Supreme Court said is, because he came back in what was a second habeas petition to raise it, said, yes, I mean, this is the time to raise it because he's now facing execution. And the question is, what's his mental state now? You know, it wouldn't have been appropriate to raise it when he wasn't actually facing execution. It would be kind of a crazy system to procedurally bar him from litigating his present mental state because he hadn't litigated it years before. And they also set out a requirement uh, that when an inmate made the kind of substantial showing that Panetti had made, that they be given a fair hearing uh, and determination of whether, in fact, uh, they were competent to face execution. Uh, an issue, I guess, that flows out of this, and Professor Coleman knows more about than I do, is what is the consequence of a finding that you are so mentally ill that you can't be executed? And the, the obvious question is, can you forcibly medicate an inmate to make them sufficiently sane so you can then kill them? Uh, and I guess doctors may have a question whether that's ethical, but then the legal question is, is it proper to do that? Uh, and that is an issue that was not uh, addressed, or at least not resolved, by the United States Supreme Court. Uh, let me address a few other things that are coming up, and then I can answer questions. And I see Jim's making a lot of comp notes, so he's going to correct anything I've said. Uh, in terms of, of pending cases, uh, a non-constitutional U.S. Supreme Court case that I at least want to alert folks to involving the death penalty is a case out of the Sixth Circuit, uh, Harbison versus Bell, I think it is, where they've granted cert. And the issue involves statutory construction, and it is whether the federal statutes properly authorize the federal courts to pay for state clemency work in death penalty cases. And it may seem kind of an archaic or not terribly you know, earth-shattering issue, uh, but it can have incredible importance and has importance in North Carolina. The way the system works is the state doesn't seek to set death dates until you've exhausted all your avenues of relief. So basically, you've gone through state court, you go through federal court, you go to the Fourth Circuit. If you lose, you ask the US Supreme Court to grant you cert. Only when the U.S. Supreme Court denies cert do they then set an execution date, and then the issue is, is clemency. And at that point, your lawyers who are representing you are people who have been appointed by the federal court to represent you either in federal district court or the Fourth Circuit. And they are, in essence, the only lawyers available who know anything about the case, kind of on short notice. The Fourth Circuit has read the federal statutes as allowing them to pay those lawyers to represent the inmate in making a clemency petition to the governor. Uh, and while our current governor has not been particularly generous with clemency, he has granted a few, and in the past other governors have, and it's an important st stage of the process. The Sixth Circuit read the same statute and said courts are not authorized, federal courts are not authorized to pay for these state proceedings, and the U.S. Supreme Court has granted cert. If they were to rule that federal courts are not authorized to pay for state clemency, then unless the states change their statute and authorize payments, you'll have a significant number of inmates facing execution with no lawyers doing the clemency work. Um, so, uh, you know, from our perspective, it's an important case. And, you know, it is, to be honest, I think, a poorly drafted and ambiguous statute. Presumably, the justices' views of the importance of clemency and the death penalty in general may affect their willingness to read the statute one way or the other. Uh, another issue that's going to be, I think it's, it's going to be voted on September 29th in their next conference, is the extent to which victim impact evidence can be used. Uh, U.S. Supreme Court has at least now ruled that the state may put on victim impact evidence as part of its presentation as to why death should be imposed. Uh, and I've seen well done victim impact evidence and can be incredibly moving and very hard to overcome, and I've seen it not so well done. The case involved murder of, I think, a college student, and the state, with the victim's mother's help, put together a video presentation with pictures and movies from this person's life growing up and becoming older, and had background music, Enya, uh, always a favorite for death penalty, uh, and then scenes of horses galloping across the plain because that's where she imagined it actually it sounded very moving. I don't mean to belittle it. Uh, and, you know, that's incredibly, if well done, incredibly powerful stuff in terms of a kind of an emotional impact. Uh, and, you know, at least there's some chance the U.S. Supreme Court will pick that case because it presents such kind of a, 
an extreme example of how it's presented, to make some determination of how far the state can go in using victim impact evidence. Uh, I've used up a bunch of my time. I'll take questions. Yes? In terms of the, uh, you had said that a lot of states incorrectly interpreted the, the prior, the first opinion about uh, the raping of Coker. <laughs> the, Co the Coker case. So I, I know some of the dissents said that saying that there's a national consensus against child rape was an unfair statement because states incorrectly, mm -hmm. perhaps incorrectly interpreted that case to say that it pre prohibited everything but homicide. I was wondering what your, your personal view was, well, Professor Coleman, too. My professional view is that the states did it because they didn't want the death penalty. My personal view is I think there's a realistic chance that legislators looked at that and said, either we don't think we can do it, or more realistically, the expense and, and effort of creating this system with the risk that it will be struck down is such that we're not willing to take that risk. I mean, it's, it is not enacting legislation and doing capital prosecutions is not cost free. And when there's a case out there which arguably supports the notion that what you're doing is going to be struck down, uh, it certainly would uh, reduce the likelihood of state legislators enacting those laws. Uh, and so I think, you know, I don't know that it's an absolute one way or the other, but it certainly would suggest that it would take less states enacting the laws to reflect a change in attitudes than you would have if there wasn't Coker out there. Uh, though reading Coker itself clearly is limited to an adult uh, female in that. It's an interesting, I mean, the Eighth Amendment, in a sense, is an interesting thing because it largely only ratchets one way. And in fact, you know, in reading uh, the decision says, we, you know, we believe it is our job to constrain the use of the death penalty. But what happens, of course, is if they rule that you cannot execute somebody who's mentally retarded, there's no, and, and in part because states have increasingly chosen not to do that and have increasingly not used the statutes that are on the books to execute the mentally retarded, how do you ever undo that? How do you ever show a changing consensus when nobody can do it because it's been ruled unconstitutional? Uh, and, you know, at least as I read the majority opinion, they say that's a good thing. Well, you know, the whole idea is that the evolving standards of decency should move towards a reduction in the death penalty and should never move the other way. The dissent, I think, would take issue with that, that, you know, if in fact you look at evolving standards, they can evolve in either direction. But under the current precedent, you know, it's pretty difficult to evolve increasing the death penalty. It can only really evolve decreasing it. Yeah, could, could I just, uh, I'll, I'll mention on the, on the question of whether the states misunderstood Coker and, and as a result of that, states that might have uh, imposed a death penalty for the rape of a child did not do so. You could make that argument, but you could just as well argue that once uh, another state adopted a death penalty for that crime, ordinarily what happens in this country is that all of the states fall in line. You know, in other words, if you would expand the death penalty to include drive-by uh, you know, shootings, then that becomes a factor that makes a, uh, a homicide a uh, eligible for the death penalty. But uh, Louisiana and I think one other state adopted uh, the death penalty for the rape of a, uh, of a child, and other states did not follow. And so you could argue from that that you know, we had reached a point, because the standard is evolving standard of decency. And so we had reached a point in the country where states did not view that as an appropriate punishment. So you, you, could, you, know, you, could, you could argue both ways, but I think the fact that other states did not follow suit because it's very easy to simply adopt the death penalty for some crime, and you know that's that's done all the time, even when there's no uh, intention to uh, to try to impose it. I think that there's much possibility that the Supreme Court will revisit the death penalty and the felony murder kind of case. In terms of whether felony murder can ever be. <sighs> Probably not in the near future. I mean, it's certainly an area where, you know, we would hope legislatures might take action. And there are, I believe, in some states, differing rules of, of the level of involvement. For example, Virginia, I believe, uh, to some extent, does not authorize the death penalty if somebody is guilty only of felony murder and didn't actually, isn't the trigger man, for example. 
But in terms of a constitutional rule on that, I would be surprised if they, if a case developed and that they took a case that said, in essence, if you don't actually perform the act of killing or, you know, have actually premeditated a, an intent to kill, that you cannot be subject to the death penalty. It would probably be, you know, in some ways, that and serious mental illness are probably the next issues that one could make a credible argument on. In North Carolina, there was an attempt last legislative session, I think going to be another one this legislative session, to preclude imposition of the death penalty for people who are seriously mentally ill. Uh, much of what can be said about people who are mentally retarded could be said about those who are seriously mentally ill. And in fact, jurors, at least when, when you could sentence somebody to death who's mentally retarded, the average juror could understand the mitigating value of being retarded, I mean, assuming that they understood the facts of the case. And so while people who are retarded were sentenced to death, I suspect that's an issue with some jury appeal. The problem with people who are seriously mentally ill is that their mental illness can as often appear, A, as aggravation because it's scary. I mean, people who are paranoid schizophrenic, for example, are not warm, fuzzy kind of people. Uh, and as Gotta Legrand's case shows, and this happens again and again, it interferes with their ability to participate in the trial. They often cause problems in their own trials. They try to represent themselves. They act out in a way that makes them scary, in a way that a retarded defendant does not. I mean, the mentally retarded may not always understand the proceedings, but they're much less likely to do things as sabotage their own defense. So, you know, if one could agree on a definition of serious mental illness, you know, there is at least some argument uh, for legislative change, and then legislative change, if it happened enough, could lead to an Eighth Amendment argument on that. And so, for example, the ABA has adopted policy statements about that. The two APAs, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychological Association, have adopted policy statements saying there should be no death penalty for the seriously mentally ill. That's an avenue, I mean, we're not we're near the U.S. Supreme Court agreeing with it, but is at least started. And then the issue of, of felony murder uh, on that. Once again, I guess you'd have to have some agreement of when is something, something you know, strictly a felony murder and when is it a premeditated murder. And many felony murders have an element of premeditation, but clearly there's an argument to be made. I do think, at least in North Carolina recently, when the defendant is really only being convicted based on felony murder, the likelihood of a death sentence is going down dramatically, which would support the argument that they shouldn't even be subject to it, but also means there's fewer cases where anybody's really arguing about that because they generally aren't getting the death penalty. Yeah. Are there any cases uh, coming up the pipeline, either towards the Supreme Court or in North Carolina, raising the issue of the death row phenomenon? Which is? Which is that, um, that prolonged stays on death row uh, are themselves cruel and unusual punishment. I know that that has been unsuccessfully litigated in the past, and I think the court's reaction has been that there's a certain amount of chutzpah to fighting, to putting off your execution, and then complaining that you were on death row too long. And so I think the only way I think you would succeed on that is if you were in a situation where you could show that the extreme delays that were present there were kind of despite your best efforts to get your case litigated. Uh, and to be honest, the average death row lawyer, not necessarily the average death row inmate, but certain lawyers, are not in favor of their cases ever being resolved. Uh, so I think that's a hard argument to be made. And it would also depend on what the conditions on death row were like. Some are much, much worse than others. Some systems are much slower than others. I think that's one where, you know, arguing to the public that, look, I've delayed my execution for 20 years, and now because of that you can't put me to death, is a tough sell to a uh, you know to judges who recognize the public is aware of of these arguments. On the mental health, would it, if that case reach if that uh, if a case like that reaches the Supreme Court, <coughs> would it make a difference if the um, defendant uh, say knew he was mentally ill, he was medicated, he voluntarily went off his medication, you know, at the time of his trial or even at the time he committed the crime? Yeah, I, I think the the guidelines that are you know at this point exist largely from policy groups like the ABA or the APA don't make that distinction. They, now, they distinguish as best they can between what you know, we view as mental illness and what may be personality disorder. So for example, if your mental illness, this, the main symptom of your mental illness is that you kill people, uh, and I have a client for whom that's true, uh, then you don't qualify. But if you are seriously mentally ill, the fact that you could have received treatment or had received treatment and went off it 
is not a disqualifying factor. And I think what a, a, I'm guessing what a mental health expert would say is that often seriously mentally ill people go off of treatment for one of two reasons. One is the medication makes them feel terrible. I mean, they're zombies. Or two, they come to believe they're no longer mentally ill because, you know, oh, I'm feeling fine, so I don't need the medicine. So it would be a rare case where somebody was mentally ill and intentionally stopped taking medicine so they could commit a crime. Uh, seriously mentally ill people often go off their meds, but that's because of the difficulty of keeping them compliant with, with a regime of, of medicine that most people would choose not to take if they had a choice in that. Um, when I was a law student, I did some death penalty defense work in the summers in Alabama. And um, one of the problems we bumped up against was trying to prove that someone was mentally retarded. Mm -hmm. Alabama wanted their like elementary school <coughs> IQ test, which had oftentimes been destroyed. Do you expect the Supreme Court to ever offer any guidance about situations like that? I can't say no, but I'm not aware of any cases, for example, in the federal courts of appeals that present that. I, I know that it is a serious issue at the trial level proving it or even at federal district court. There was a case a number of years ago where Judge Boyle here granted relief, but one of the issues was, you know, the states are free to define within limits mental retardation. North Carolina requires an IQ test you know, individually administered by a licensed psychologist. This particular defendant had Growing up in eastern North Carolina, rural county, segregated school system, they didn't have the resources. And so one of the state's arguments was, well, this IQ test can't be considered because it doesn't meet the standard. And the lawyers, actually lawyers at the center said, well, wait a minute, that's, you know, he grows up in an underfunded racist school system, and then you use that to preclude him. And Judge Boyle said, well, I'm going to consider this because otherwise, you know, he's being precluded from proving retardation because of the effects of this segregated school system. And the state, when he granted relief, the state wisely said, you know, that's not a case we want to take up to the Fourth Circuit. So there are individual judges who consider things like that. Uh, the, the difficulty in litigating mental retardation, I think, is probably at its worst at the trial level. North Carolina gives judges the discretion to have a hearing before trial or to have the jury decide it. And the problem with having a jury decide mental retardation, I think, is twofold. One is they decide it after they've decided the defendant's guilty of first-degree murder, and there is this gut-level feeling of, well, if you're retarded, you couldn't have done what we've... And secondly, retardation is very hard to detect in the kind of people where it's really being contested. I mean, if you've got an IQ, you know, in the mid-50s, there's no question, but if it's in the mid to upper 60s, and you're an adult, and you've learned to kind of have this cloak of competency and to muddle through, and, and your, your family may be also disabled and not recognize. It can be tough because it doesn't meet what jurors expect, you know, the retarded person to look like, although they are clearly retarded. And jurors are very unwilling, having convicted somebody, to then find them retarded. Uh, not totally, but it is a much tougher venue, so to speak. And that's really where, you know, the difficulty in North Carolina lies at the trial level is, is that. Yeah. Um, just back to the trial rape case um, that the Supreme Court saw, was their opinion or holding, did it rely more on the fact that, that the death penalty was not an appropriate punishment or more on that you just can't, because um, of all these external factors like the harm to the victim and the risk of convicting someone or, you know, the, the um, victim being coached? I'm not sure that they relied specifically, I mean, as I read it, they very specifically said, we look at, quote, objective criteria such as the number of states and, you know, whether people are adding or subtracting, but we don't rest on that. We also look at our own analysis. But within that analysis, I don't know that they specifically said we give more weight to our own moral sense of how serious a crime is or to these what could be viewed as policy considerations of dragging, you know, a child through a capital trial. Um, I would suspect, well, I don't know, I mean, because it's probably a unique situation where you have a child living victim testifying that in other types of cases like a seriously mentally ill defendant or a felony murder you wouldn't even have. So I'm not sure it would come up again for them to say, well, we really gave that minor weight or that was really a controlling thing. It seemed to be more kind of a listing of all the reasons why they didn't think it was appropriate, some of which I think one could d debate are really legislative prerogative and not really arguably proper consideration for an Eighth Amendment analysis. The dissent certainly said, 
Concern about the victim is not a reason to exclude the death penalty for the defendant. Uh, and there's at least some validity to that argument. OK, I think we're just about out of time. Do you want to correct anything I said? Uh, no correction, <laughs> but uh, just to uh, bring to your attention something. As I said at the very beginning, we, don't, we, we no longer have a, a death penalty clinic. But we, we now have uh, a center for criminal justice, uh, which is going to look sort of broadly into criminal justice issues. And uh, one of the cases that we are handling is the Gala Grand case out of the center. We're going to do a, uh, a supplemental clemency petition based on the, uh, the judge finding that he was not competent to be uh, executed uh, in, in light of the Supreme Court uh, decision uh, that uh, the judge, a, a judge has the discretion uh, not to permit a a mentally ill defendant to defend himself. A second case that uh, we are considering uh, is a case in Florida where the uh, inmate has been on death row for more than 25 years. And for a period of that time, uh, it's, it was because the state chose not to proceed uh, to resentence him uh, because of cost and because they were at the time trying to execute a serial killer. Uh, we're going to actually make the argument that uh, it would violate the Eighth Amendment now to, uh, to try to execute him. Uh, the, the significance of 25 years is that that was the alternative sentence at the time he was sentenced to death. So in effect, he has been in prison for as long as he would have been if he had been sentenced to life uh, at the time that he originally was sentenced. So if you're interested in one of those two cases, you might just drop me an email uh, and uh, it's an opportunity to volunteer uh, in a capital case. Okay, thank you all. Tom.